again, going to the astrology, which is part of my language and my lens yeah, 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 yeah. coming in. But this year, 2023, one of the, I would say the biggest thing happening astrologically is that Pluto is squaring the nodes of the moon for everybody. That's what's happening in the sky. So Pluto is often associated with the the archetype of the caterpillar turning into the you know, going into the chrysalis and turning mm. into the goop and then eventually becoming the butterfly right so mm. so it's i think what you're talking about that dismembering yeah, it's, it's the same process yeah. it's the same exact thing and for pluto to be squaring the nodes of the moon is is that but exponentially <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah so uh, it's and on done on a collective level so and it and it's also kind of a in a sense can be interpreted as like a choice point where we're all being, we're all the caterpillars being, our whole world is essentially being the cap caterpillar going into the chrysalis, getting dismembered into that goop. And then in a certain way, we maybe have kind of a little bit of a choice to maybe, I don't actually know if I believe that, but astrologically what it would suggest, like something squaring the nodes is like, there's a sort of a kind of choice there to go this way or this way maybe i don't feel it so much as a choice in my life i feel like i'm being pushed in the particular direction pretty strongly and mm -hmm. but i think there that some of you know anyway there's probably an element of choice there and but on this big collective level i exactly i would definitely say yes it feels like like a moment for me it feels like a moment of going through a like a tunnel like through a portal mm -hmm. and and I don't know what will come out, what will be there when we come out the other side. It doesn't scare me. I think it's actually really exciting and fun in a certain way, but it's exactly that. It's like, like a, we get dissolved and we can't know what we don't know. <laughs> right, right. So it's like, we're starting, we're, we're, we're in an initiating moment at the same time that we are dissolved into goop. Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, I am joined by mother, author, healer, and astrologer, Martha Alter Hines, to discuss her upcoming book, Consciousness in Bloom, and the second annual Rebecoming the One Symposium. Martha talks about narrative and the power of changing our stories, the importance of remembering ourselves as infinite existence, the wisdom of the grandmothers, healing of self and world, and so much more. Also, please be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. Your support is truly appreciated. Martha Alter Hines, MSW, is a mom, an author, a healer, and an astrologer. Martha has 20 years of experience as a clinical social worker, psychotherapist, and body worker. She has primarily studied evolutionary astrology with Ari Moshe Wolf and is currently a student of Heather Ensworth as well. Martha bridges her trauma-informed clinical background with her astrological knowledge, as well as a deep understanding of ourselves as beings of the cosmos, earth, divine, heart, mind, and so much more. Martha was born in Thailand and grew up in ba Bangladesh, Pakistan, Kenya, and the United States. Therefore, she has a deep passion for alleviating the suffering of our world. Martha is dedicated to serving our world, to helping us each to thrive, and to supporting us to come back into the infinite wisdom and healing that is our natural state of being. Martha, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you, Nick. I am honored to be here. Well, I am so happy that you are here and that we're having this discussion. We've known each other for a year now, I believe. And I just wanted to say that I am wildly impressed with the work that you do. And, you know, I'm grateful to have been a small part of it and to continue to be a small part of that. And just witnessing what you do, I, I see you being devoted to healing and to building connections and community. And you do all of this with a warmth, integrity, and passion. Uh, mm. So I am very, very impressed. And I'm very happy to have this conversation and welcome you to the program today. 
Thank you. And I have loved working with you and your integrity and your commitment and passion to similar things, justice yeah. and yeah. healing and helping our world in a real way. Yeah. Well, I think that that's what's needed right now. And, you know, you've got this background in trauma and maybe this isn't the, you know, the happiest way to start this conversation, but I often feel like we are all traumatized and that the trauma is very, very deep and, you know, that there are levels of trauma. And so I thought that maybe we could start with a little bit of your background because you've got a really interesting background and how that led you to trying to help alleviate the trauma and the suffering of the world. Sure. When you say I have an interesting background, which <laughs> well, I think, I think your biographical background is really interesting. Mm. Um, and I know that you've written about being exposed to the suffering of others in other cultures. And I think that's something that we often don't necessarily think about that, how good we have it here, but yet we still suffer, you know, we still yeah. have our own traumas, but I, I just thought that your kind of your biographical background and then some of the work that you've done, how that has informed the work that you're doing now. Yeah. I have to not cry while I say these things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like you said, in my bio, I was born in Thailand, but my my dad was actually actually stationed in Dhaka, Bangladesh when I was born, and he worked for USAID, United States Agency for International Development. Part of He was a diplomat, essentially, for the U.S. government, but he did development work, so helping people have food and, you know, schools and things like that in different parts of the world. So my first home was Bangladesh, and I lived there until I was four and a half. And then we moved to the United States and then I, we moved to Pakistan, Peshawar, Pakistan, which is on the border of Afghanistan. And I, I was born in 77. So when we moved to Pakistan, it was the eighties and it was in the middle of the Russia, Russia, Afghan war. Mm -hmm. And Peshawar again is right. It's on, at the, on the Khyber pass, which is what goes between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And so there were, Peshawar was filled with Afghan refugees and my first caregivers both in Bangladesh and in Pakistan were my my nannies my ayahs who were Bengali women or Bangladeshi women and then my ayah in Pakistan who later became my stepmother which is you know you can read between the lines of how that happened <laughs> not not so good but I was extremely close to her and starting when I was seven and she, <clears throat> she was, her family was originally Hindu, but like the sweeper caste of Hindu, So the lowest caste mm. of Hindu people. And at the time of partition in, in India, her family was so poor, they couldn't go from what was becoming Pakistan to what, what, to what was going to stay India. So essentially they, converted to Catholicism and to be Catholic in Pakistan is better than being Hindu because if you're Hindu, you're killed, <laughs> but still you're, if you're Catholic Christian, you're, you're really ostracized and treated as pretty horrible, very horribly. So anyway, the stories that she told me as I was growing up were pretty horrific. And she was, you know, married at age 11 had 13 pregnancies starting at age 13, lost nine of those babies before they age, turned to age two. So four of her children survived past age two. And and she she herself died in 2001 when she was somewhere between 48 and 52. She didn't know how old she was. She didn't have a birth certificate. So she didn't, wasn't sure how old she was, but essentially not that much older than me. I'm 46 now. So she was a tiny bit older than I am now. But she considered herself an old woman by then because her life had been so intense and difficult and traumatic. So I think, you know, being raised by women like her <clears throat> is just ingrained in me, the perspective on life that they 
have and had and the reality that the privileges we have here in the United States, especially as white people in the upper middle class, <laughs> um, pretty off the chart, pretty, I don't take it lightly, let me put it like that. Right. And yeah, it colors everything that I do and everything that I think, and it grounds me, like it just brings me right back to reality that that's how the vast, 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 vast majority of the world lives. Yeah. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, but. Yeah, that gives a lot of background as to what led you to do this work. And I can totally understand that. I, you know, I've been in a, I've been to Nepal a few times and, mm. you know, that's a, the first time I went was in 2001. And I know at that point it was considered one of the most impoverished countries in the world. Mm. And I went back in 2003. This was both times it was part of a program at the University of Denver. And the first time I went, I was a student. And the second time I went, I was the site director. And something that I learned as the site director that I had to deal with was poverty shock. Yeah. Uh, and for especially the students, because some of them were just, they had a really difficult time dealing with just the suffering that they were seeing and how open it was. And uh, it did bring up these questions of privilege, right? It brought up questions of privilege. Yes. When I was 19, I went back to Pakistan and lived in my stepmother's village for a month. And I, that is a long, long, long story. But essentially, you know, I had grown up, I had grown, it's not like this was new to me, but I hadn't been there as a young adult yet. And I hadn't been there since I was a kid. And her family is extremely poor. I mean, extreme, like dirt floors, no running water, no electricity, you know, the whole deal. And, and the way that women are treated in Pakistan is, you know, as we know, right. unreal. It, ugh, I won't go there. It's like so yeah. bad, <laughs> so bad. So long story short, I came back to the United States and I, I had shut off, like something inside me snapped while I was over there and I came back numb mm. and I, I experienced kind of a, I would say like a survivor guilt. Mm. It took me, it took me a few months to come around to the reality that like, I felt guilty for feeling happy ever because the suffering was so intense there and for the suffering of people I really deeply love, right? Not just like, not just quote unquote anyone, it was people I really directly knew. And, and I, but then I came to this conclusion, which I've, which I've remembered over and over and over again since then, which is, and I think it's relevant probably just for lots of us, maybe all of us, that we, if, if we have the opportunity to be happy, we should take it <laughs> because yeah. The only way for anybody in the world to be happy is for the people who can be happy to be happy. Does that make sense? Like, and I'm not saying that you can't be happy when you're poor or suffering. I, I'm just saying if there's some trigger in you that allows for joy and happiness to move through your body, do it <laughs> mm. because it's like, it's like a contagious, right? It just, it will mm. spread. And that's the only way for you to have it spread. If you stay shut down and not happy but you have the choice to open up to it you're actually doing a disservice but but it took me a long time to come to that you know when i was 19 20 and yeah it was really interesting looking back on that yeah it it seems like it would also have informed a deep compassion yes you know, not just the joy but the compassion to understand the suffering and then want to try to alleviate it but I like that idea of embracing your joy and embracing your happiness, because I think so many of us, especially in the United States, we just don't do that. I don't see us being very happy, mm -mm. <laughs> you know? No. And in a way, I would actually say my stepmother was one of the happiest people I have ever known in my whole life. Yeah. Which is, you know, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I experienced that in Nepal too. It, you know, it, it's such a clash of what we know when you are in that kind of impoverished society and women in Nepal the first time I was there I worked with a or a NGO called Tiwa 
and Tiwa means support in Nepali and their mission was to help Nepali women. Mm. And so they were doing things. They were with the, they had some connection, I think, to the International Women's Fund, mm. but they were doing things like just micro grants so that a woman could buy a cow and yeah. then milk the cow, sell the milk at the market and try to be a little bit more self-sufficient. And they were doing literacy courses because the literacy in Nepal was pretty bad, especially for women. What was interesting though, is they also had to open it up to the men because often the husbands were like, no, I'm not going to let my wife learn to yeah. read because they didn't know how to read. So yeah. they were, you know, opening it up to the couples just to do it. But, you know, all of that said, the big clash and it, it causes a bit of confusion is I did see people being happy in ways that we aren't, even in the poverty that there was this connection and joy. And I remember once there was a, I don't remember his name and I'm, I'm kind of ashamed that I don't remember his name, but he had a position in the, the government, I think. But the first time we went, he invited us all over to his house many times and fed us. And I remember the last evening, I was just moved to tears by it because I couldn't understand. There was a part of me that could not understand how someone living, and he was well-to-do according to their standards, you know, yeah, their yeah. society, but how someone who lived in such poverty could be so giving. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. My stepmom, I mean, and this is not just her, like. I'm not kidding. I would say, oh, I love your shirt. Oh, here it's for you. Yeah. You know, oh, I love your shoes. It's they're yours. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. That is not what I meant. <laughs> but then, you know, she would be really sad if I wouldn't accept it. Yeah. So I just stopped telling her I like things. Yeah. She, she would give them all to me. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Totally different, totally different mindset. And and I think that that's a lot of the work that you're doing is helping us birth a new mindset. Hmm. Is that fair? I have a quote of yours that I heard you say in an interview with Heather Ensworth recently. And it's, you said that we are midwifing ourselves back into a remembering of who we are. Hmm. And I found that to be really profound. And I was wondering if I could ask you if you could maybe expound upon that a little bit what you mean by that. And I think that'll get us into some other areas of interest for you. Sure. Yeah. Well, and as I said, right before we started recording, another way that it's kind of being worded for me lately is in the last few days is <clears throat> that we are all inevitably indigenous to the cosmos and the earth is part of the cosmos. And therefore we are of course, also indigenous to this planet Earth. And so what keeps coming alive for me is that I feel like essentially we've forgotten what it feels like and what it is to live as indigenous beings of where we live, where we are, who we are. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, as you and I have talked about, including in your the talk you did for the symposium I held a year ago we in this day and age in the culture you and I both are in and lots of us are in tend to see ourselves as separate from mm. quote unquote nature even though mm. the reality is what's not nature we are obviously we're nature if we're not nature what are we <laughs> right, right. what created us I think we're natural beings uh, anyway yeah. so yeah we just we have for lots and lots of reasons had this illusion of separation from lots of things and when we come back into a remembering of who we actually are as beings of the earth as beings of the cosmos as beings of infinity then yeah it's like a, a a ripple effect of so many things that come back online and yeah so there's many 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 layers yeah <laughs> yeah and i love all of what you just said and agree with all that you just said. And let's kind of stay there and kind of unpack some things for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So where to start? I think that, you know, one of the things that you talked about in, I guess it's a book you're working on 
that's called Consciousness in Bloom. And I want to go back to that title at some point. Mm -hmm. But you talk about stories and restoring myths in our lives. And I think that that is also incredibly important. One of the things that has been very influential to me through the doctoral program that I went to, it was the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program at the California Institute of Integral Studies. Mm -hmm. And one of the core faculty members there who just retired was Brian Swim. Mm -hmm. And Brian has published several books with Thomas Berry. And that is actually one of the key themes in Brian's work is that we have to remember who we are. And it's, there's this importance of the stories that we tell. And one of the things that I love about Brian's work is he has this line of when we look at the stars, because, you know, it was Carl Sagan who always liked to say, you know, we are stardust. Mm -hmm. right and technically we are everything yeah. that we are made of was generated in the furnace of a star totally. and the way that brian would tell this and it's the, the the magic of metaphor i think and this is the magic of story is like you know when you look at the stars you know and i'm kind of paraphrasing don't just look at them as you know giant balls of gas but quite literally the stars are our ancestors literally yeah. yes. like if it, if not that then what like that right. is what, yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah but we've had these stories that have told us that we are separate mm -hmm. and those stories come a lot from religious traditions you know there's been i know in christianity there's been criticisms of genesis right at the beginning that we are to have dominion over everything and we need a new story. And that's what Brian tries to do. He tries to combine the stories with our latest scientific understanding. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So in what ways do you see reimagining stories? Is there one particular story or a group of stories that you think are deserving of a retelling? Yes. And can I give a little background on why that yeah, even yeah, matters? Please, so, please, please. So something I I think I talk about in that first draft of Consciousness and Bloom is, you know, as a ther as a psychotherapist, a lot of what I did was some version of narrative therapy in some way, right? There's, you know, there's narrative therapy, there's art therapy, there's play therapy, the, all of these versions of therapeutic techniques that are essentially about both externalizing, like putting outside of ourselves, the things in us that are maybe getting really feel really mixed up. And like, we can't make sense of it. Like some traumatic thing happens. And then it's just it, like all the feelings and all the emotions and all the thoughts and everything that our body experience of it is, is here in us. But, but when it's in us only, it can be really confusing and hard to figure out and hard to deal with, right? So there are a lot of therapeutic techniques that help us to see it outside of ourselves so we can make more sense of it. And one of the one of the aspects of doing that is to help a client essentially to re to come up with a new narrative of whatever happened, right? So it, there's so many ways that can happen. But one of the reasons that's so important is because whatever story we tell ourselves about anything is really what's going to affect us more than the thing that actually happened, mm. you know? So, I mean, and there's just so many examples of that. Like somebody can walk in a room and say a word and a range of people could have, could be elated, could be traumatized, could be sad, could be excited, you know, all based on whatever story they have around what that was of that mm. person walking in saying the word, whatever it was. Right. So narrative on so many levels impacts us far beyond what I think we often realize or acknowledge. So that's why narrative to me really matters. And <clears throat> so in terms of specific stories, yeah, there's so many <laughs> 
where to start any of them. But for example, in that consciousness in bloom, I talk about the narrative around Saturn mm. and also the narrative around the goddesses. So like I'm an astrologer. So for example, Saturn, I gave a free talk all about Saturn a couple months ago, because this matters to me so much, <laughs> because what will often happen in a lot of astrology readings for people, I've heard this from so many people they'll say yeah i went to see an astrologer and they saw that saturn was doing this thing to my chart and i'm gonna die when i'm 55 <laughs> whatever you know because saturn sometimes is associated with time and death in a certain sense yeah. you know limits boundaries all that kind of thing that's not very helpful to have someone tell you you're gonna die at a particular it, it's it's because First of all, I don't think you almost can ever possibly know that from an astrology chart, but that's a different issue. Regardless of whether you can or can't, how is that therapeutic or helpful or healing for that person? It, to me, right. it's just not. And there are many, many ways we can re-narrate the story of Saturn or Kronos. Or for me, really what it comes down to is a lot of, for example, the, the planets in our culture are named after Roman and Greek gods and mostly gods occasional goddesses like venus but but we then can go backward from let's say the roman or greek myth if we go back we can maybe find the roots in a sumerian myth or you know like we can go back and trace where the stories came from but really ultimately the planets were given names and meaning and story by people all over the world for the whole existence of humans, you know, I think, I assume, because they all were seeing up through Saturn. Those Saturn's the most is the farthest away that's visible without a telescope. So so people tended to tell stories about all these beings in the sky forever, right? And they would have all been different-ish, <laughs> depending on where you are. So I, first of all, find it really not helpful to think of any story around a planet, for example, as being a concrete truth. Mm -hmm. That's just not, not true and not helpful. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that, you know, anyway, there's many, many, many examples there. And even if we take something like Saturn we can give it a narrative that's very patriarchal and very domineering and very all of those things, which again, doesn't feel very good. Or we can take another approach and think, go backward in the roots of where does, where, what are some other ways we can think of Saturn? So for example, with Saturn, there's the equivalent of Anki mm. in pre-Roman Greek mythology. And Anki is a, just a very, very different energy is very it, he he's you know, a shaman basically he's like a, a wisdom keeper he's someone who sees both worlds of light and dark and death and life and can help is there as a as a support not as a somebody who's gonna you know hit us over the head as a patriarch yeah and that makes a huge difference huge 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 difference if you yeah, yeah you feel something is there to hold you and support you in the way you need versus you you're scared of authority and you're scared of hmm. yeah. the rules or whatever yeah yeah we have a tendency to forget i think that all myths are multivalent that there are many meanings to the myths and yeah. you know like with saturn you know i'm not an astrologer, but I do understand a little bit of the meaning, especially like you said, that Saturn is the the furthest planet out that we can see visibly. And then it makes sense that Saturn gets associated with limitations mm -hmm. because literally that was the limit. You couldn't go beyond that. And the way I'm thinking about this is, you know, I, you know, I'm familiar with Saturn in terms of the Saturn return, which I think is very, very real. I understand that. I know what my Saturn would return was like. And I can see that in mythology too, because I think there's no mistake that, 
you know, Jesus began his teachings at the time that he would have probably been in his Saturn return. The Siddhartha, the Buddha began his teaching right around the time that he would have been in his Saturn return. Cause that's around 2830. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, both of them. And so there can be a painful process involved, but look at the gift that we got out of that. And I always think of Saturn in that way is that, yeah, there may be struggle, but there's also a gift. And I think that in the figure of Kronos, Kronos is associated, you know, it's our figure of the, both the, the grim reaper, but also the old man time, the, you know, my students tell me that no one talks about this, this imagery anymore of the new year where there's like the baby new year and the old man year, but that old man year with the scythe, that's Saturn. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and it's the same figure as the, the grim reaper. And I'm like, but if we get the, remove the grim part, there's this idea of harvest Yeah, that the harvest, there's going to be a bounty that comes in with all of that. Mm-hmm. And so it seems like that's something that we can remember in terms of Saturn, but then also like you did connect it to other mythologies and other beings. And I think that opens up. And Saturn, what I've read about Saturn also is that Saturn was also associated with like a very, um, a leader who led during like a golden age. So Mm -hmm. like, like the, the leadership quality of the Saturn energy is actually very beneficent was very in service of the good of the community and you know was a god associated with agriculture which i'm assuming is where the the sith is coming so i'm assuming that's all connected there so yeah i think the i think i'm not an expert in this at all but i think the chronos mythology is a more harsh than even the saturn mythology if i have that right uh, yeah, so there's a softer side to even if we, we dig further into even Saturn, there's there's a lot of goodness and generosity and yeah, yeah. wisdom, deep, deep, real wisdom. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, and I like the idea of working with stories because I've been recognizing it's interesting how our thoughts change, you know, over time. And one of the things that I've been recognizing especially with students and i find myself kind of saying this a lot now is that it's all stories we're just telling ourselves stories all the time you know and it's a difficult move at times because we want to say well no this isn't a story you know that you know the scientific method for example i mean it's so important and valuable but it's a story in yes. many ways, you know. One of my favorite things that one of my undergrad professors, my one of my, my actually my my main psychology professor, she ended up being my sponsor in college. She would she taught my abnormal psych class in undergrad. And this this carried me through my whole time of being a psychotherapist, and I still think about it. She talks about the reification of the DSM. Mm. right like in other words so the dsm is the diagnostics manual for psychologists and psychotherapists and doctors and whoever and and so we have quote-unquote diagnoses in there but guess what those are all made up by humans all Mm. of them you cannot even like with okay adhd is my perfect example is there is no you can't look under a microscope and see a virus that is called adhd (laughs) Mm-hmm. There is no such thing. So anything, any of those diagnoses is it's made up by humans. It's we are talking about symptoms that we put on a list, and the, the list of symptoms happens to be grouped into the under this name that one of us happened to make up. And then we go around saying, I have ADHD, as though it's like strep throat. And it's not. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> it's not. So I'm not saying that ADHD isn't real. I'm just saying it, it's a story. It's a yeah. story we constructed and that maybe has some benefit to having that narrative around it, but it's just a narrative. That's all right. it is. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think that it's interesting because in the narrative, you know, you're saying this is something I have, mm-hmm. you know, and we identify with it and mm-hmm. it's so powerful to change that narrative Yeah. Uh, and to find the gifts. You know, I've had when I was every now and then it still comes back, but I've had some issues with depression and anxiety. 
And I, I stopped myself from saying that I have anxiety. Mm. Um, rather now I look at it as an ally mm. that I work with anxiety mm. and that anxiety is there for a reason, mm. but it doesn't define me yeah. that it's, it can be an ally. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah cuz with any of those things and with with any narrative like even saturn i mean we yeah. can feel like a victim to it right or we can turn around the narrative and just like you're saying okay i'm going to i'm there's this thing existing yeah and i'm going to choose what story i'm going to engage with it but it's yeah. difficult sometimes i mean you have to have a certain kind of awareness to yes. catch yourself totally um, Yes. Yeah. But then how, how do we do this on a national or global scale? How are we going to start changing these stories? <laughs> <laughs> that is a teeny tiny question. <laughs> it is. Yeah. No, well, no pressure there, Martha. No pressure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think like anything else, there's the micro and there's the macro and there's right. the personal is the political and there's, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. it's all at, all at the same time. I, I think it does start with each of us individually. And at the same time, I think it's really important to have these conversations. And like, yeah. for those of us feel, who feel called to be on YouTube videos, yeah. <laughs> that's part of it. And I do feel, feel really strongly that a lot of this healing or changing or re-narrating or all of it needs to be happening in community held spaces for mm. sure. Yeah. And there needs to be safe, safely held spaces like that, you know, with impeccable integrity. That That's what feels important to me because a lot of what we have in our community spaces is like listening to the news. That's a community space, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's not particularly healing or helpful or doesn't alleviate anxiety <laughs> for me, at least I could speak for myself. If I watch, you know, CBS news, whatever, new, anything and anything, even NPR, I'm going to probably feel anxiety, not not anxiety. I saw a headline this morning from Washington Post. I, you know, I get the Washington Post emails because I grew up in the DC area. And there was a notable headline this morning that raised my anxiety level pretty darn high. And I chose to read the first three lines because I wanted to know what was going on. And then I moved on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it just wasn't going to help. Right. But that's the, in a sense, that's a community space. So I feel like we need we need antidotes. We need community spaces that are going to hold a healing space that mm. is prom promoting the healing that we're needing. And and it, it should not only be an individual thing. That's another right. shift I think we need in this culture. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Well, yeah, I and I can relate to the news. I've actually stopped. I I can't watch the news too much anymore <laughs> and because what it would do, I always refer to it as the fear. It mm. would just create the fear and it served no purpose. It was not yeah. good. And, and, and I, I do want to talk about community spaces, but something that came to mind with what we were just talking about in terms of stories and also in terms of psychotherapy. And I think that this also connects to your larger work. And so I'm going to try to make this connection and see if I can make this make sense. But I remember that the mythologist Joseph Campbell once wrote about, I think he had a meeting with an anthropologist and the anthropologist was studying shamanism, shamans. Mm -hmm. And as he was describing the shamanic initiation, Campbell and I could get all of this wrong, but the gist of it's right, uh, is that he recognized that there was a connection between the ex initiatory experiences of shamans and schizophrenics. Mm. And that what was happening in terms of the shamanic cultures is they had stories, they had systems set up that led the person through. Wow. And that it, at the end, you know, the person then became a healer and mm -hmm. they could contribute to the society. But what we tend to do is stop them in their tracks and try mm -hmm. to pull them out. And there's no way of going through this initiatory process. Mm -hmm. And 
what came to mind, you know, I, I was thinking about that. And then I thought, you know, in a way, you know, because doesn't the word schizophrenia actually mean like split mind? I think, and I can see that on a national global level that we're kind of suffering from that. And I know others have said that we are in the process of a kind of initiation mm. and we have to kind of go through that initiation, which is going to be painful. Mm. Uh, but part of that is, and I had mentioned this before we began recording is that in the shamanic initiation, there is often they have this experience of being torn apart and they are dismembered and then they have to be remembered. They have to be reconstituted. And this gets back to what kind of launched us into this conversation is remembering who we are. Mm -hmm. We have to put ourselves together again to remember who we are. And I see that as this healing initiatory process that is involved with the stories that we tell. Absolutely. And <clears throat> again, going to the astrology, which is part of my language and my lens yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. coming in, but this year, 2023, one of the, I would say the biggest thing happening astrologically is that Pluto is squaring the nodes of the moon for everybody that's what's happening in the sky so pluto is often associated with the the archetype of the caterpillar turning into the you know, going into the chrysalis and turning mm. into the goop and then eventually becoming the butterfly right so mm. so it's i think what you're talking about that dismembering yeah, it's, it's the same process yeah. the same exact thing and for pluto to be squaring the nodes of the moon is is that but exponentially <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah so uh, it's and on done on a collective level. So, and it, and it's also kind of a, in a sense can be interpreted as like a choice point where we're all being, we're all the caterpillars being our whole world is essentially being the cap caterpillar going into the chrysalis, getting dismembered into that goop. And then in a certain way, we maybe have kind of a little bit of a choice to Maybe, I don't actually know if I believe that, but astrologically what it would suggest, like something squaring the nodes is like, there's a sort of a kind of choice there to go this way or this way, maybe. I don't feel it so much as a choice in my life. I feel like I'm being pushed in the particular direction pretty strongly. And, mm -hmm. but I think there, that some of, you know, anyway, there's probably an element of choice there. And, but on this big collective level, I exactly i would definitely say yes it feels like like a moment for me it feels like a moment of going through a like a tunnel like through a portal and and i don't know what will come out what will be there when we come out the other side it doesn't scare me i think it's actually really exciting and fun in a certain way but it's exactly that it's like, like a we get dissolved and we can't know what we don't know <laughs> right right so it's like we're starting we're we're, we're in an initiating moment at the same time that we are dissolved into goop mm -hmm. so we can't it's like we, we're getting dissolved and we're starting at the same time which is a really awkward thing to be doing at once yeah 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 dissolving into goop i think that's a really good metaphor for where we are in the world today <laughs> it just seems so true you know i also wanted to comment that also regards to something that you just said a few moments ago, that the, 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 the work is both individual and collective. Mm -hmm. And I have been saying this, that especially in regards to our environmental crisis, that it is a reflection of an inner conflict, you know, as yes. within, so without. Yes. And so we have to have both inner healing and outer healing. Yes. And I've always kind of resisted where there's this idea and even Michael Jackson had a you know, hit song with it, you know, that if you want to change the world, change yourself. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yes, that's important. But also if you want to change yourself, work to change the world. Totally. Absolutely. Yes. And I can just say something that's, you know, this is obvious, but it yeah. <laughs> keeps dawning on me also, because I am holding a lot of collective space personally. Yeah. Right. And and I just keep getting reminded 
in various ways over and over and over again, that the space that I hold either for an individual client, for myself, for my kids, for the, you know, the large groups I hold or whatever, whatever I'm doing, the space I'm holding can only be a reflection of me, literally. It's impossible for me to hold a space that is more healing than where I am in my own healing process. It's, mm. It can't happen, <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, I do think something comes in and, and supports it. And so I don't necessarily need to be in the best mood ever or whatever to hold <laughs> a truly healing space because I'm human and that isn't always true. But, but and if I'm going to hold healing space on a community level or any level, I absolutely have to keep over and over and over and over again, doing my own inner healing. And I just think that's, that just is. Yeah. And I personally wouldn't want to just do that. That feels, I shouldn't say it's never appropriate because sometimes it is extremely appropriate for me personally, it wouldn't be fulfilling what I'm here to right. do on the planet and it would feel narcissistic and yeah 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 and that's something that i really appreciate because i think that this sort of mantra of you know if you want to change the world change yourself i criticized that for a long time because i saw exactly what you said that it led to narcissism mm -hmm. um, and many times and so i so appreciate this movement i i see more and more people opening up to this where it's not just about themselves that they're recognizing that oh hey i also have to heal the world <laughs> you know that it's i'm not isolated from it and because that's one of the stories that we've been telling ourselves is that we are isolated from the world and we're isolated from each other and i think i'm sure you've seen this too you know especially in very liberal academic settings which is where i spent a lot of my young adulthood and you spend a lot of your time there's also a ton of beautiful activism going on i mean beautiful beautiful and i was huge that was a huge part of my passion was act social activism environmental mm -hmm. activism all of the above i still believe in it passionately and if that is all you do also there's so many downfalls to that including complete burnout complete right. you know like not getting what you need to physically emotionally survive <laughs> right 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 it can that so that can go to a whole extreme too yeah yeah so i mean yeah you have yeah. to have balance you have to yeah. have both you have to yeah. have self-care okay. and collective care i oh, guess yes yeah 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 for <clears throat> sure for sure and it, it seems like there is i, I kind of want to take us back a little bit or quite a bit with trauma as well and this idea of being indigenous and i think that there are stories associated with this that we have to start telling ourselves and one of the things that i think is really important especially with social justice and so on and so forth is to be honest about things mm -hmm. because i see especially in academia i still see a lot of dishonesty Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And you are way more steeped in the world, world of academia than I am. Well, it's, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's hard for me to comment on that, but I yeah. believe you and I support yeah. what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, academia is telling its own story. And I think that story has to change quite a bit, you know, and I think we have to change the stories of success um, yes. because, you know, the, the end goal is always student success. And I'm like, well, what do we mean by that? You know, is it just training students? Is it training them to take jobs in this system that's kind of destroying the planet? Because if yeah. that's all we're doing, I don't count that as success. Yeah. You know, yeah. And it's difficult to change that story. But what I was actually trying to get at with the traumas is I think that there's also ancestral traumas. Yes, absolutely that we don't actually even recognize absolutely i it's deep deep cellular ingrained trauma yeah. on every level absolutely yeah. Yes. yeah when i think that one of the 
profound traumas is that we had been, you know, all had been indigenous in a sense until there were movements that came in and especially with imperial, I'm going to refer to it as imperial Christianity Mm -hmm. that completely destroyed the old ways or incorporated them. And that's something that is always of interest to me because you have started seeing, especially in the kind of around the 1930s, 40s attempts to reconstruct these old indigenous ways. I think uh, I kind of know where you might be going with it. And I have an yeah. answer. For it. I think you might. Okay. Be going, but if you think of a question, you can go. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, go for it. Go for it. Well, um, what's coming up for me is something that we talked about before we started recording. You mentioned how I talk about in that consciousness and bloom, the remembering the wisdom of our grandmothers. Oh, yes, yes, that, yes, yes. That where you. you would maybe like to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah <the> coffee still. <laughs> kind of circulating here (laughs) (laughs) i mean what's coming up for me as you're talking is that like i talk about in that book my mother's mother's family is from scotland Mm. and in and my so it was my great grandfather who immigrated to the united states not that long ago not that many generations ago and the the lore of my family is that the women a lot of the women in Scotland and my family had quote unquote second sight. Mm. Right. And then I have all of these kind of unexplainable abilities. You know, I was mm. a massage therapist, a body worker for a long time. And what I what I learned when I started doing Reiki and craniosacral therapy and massage on people, this is my late in my late 20s, I took a break from being a, a social worker and spent five years as a body worker. And then I went back to being a social worker. So but in those five years, what I ended up realizing and noticing was I had all of these abilities when I would put my hands on people that didn't make sense and I couldn't explain it and nobody had taught me any of these things, right? So when I put my hands on people, I can see, I can see inside their bodies. I can, I can see their organs. It's like, and and I will go with I will go with a client to the doctor or to the chiropractor and there'll be an X-ray or a CT scan or an MRI, and what I have seen is precisely Mm. what the medical device shows like for example a few years ago I had a client who had a stroke and she I went to go see her in the in the nursing home where she was being cared for and I was asking the the nurse you know can you tell me exactly where in her brain the the stroke happened and she said oh I think it's over here and I said can you double check? Because I think it's right here. Like, so she was pointing to the right side and I was like, no, I'm pretty sure it's in the middle down, right down here in the left side. Cause that's where I was, when I would put my hands on her, that's what I was seeing. And so she went and checked in the file and said, oh, you're right. <laughs> it's like, wow. yep. So that, that kind of thing happened all the time with me, with client, my bodywork clients and lots of other, other like he, miraculous healings that I just somehow knew what to do. It was very weird. Where does that come from? I have no idea, but it seems like it would make sense that it's somehow connected to my Scottish ancestry, right? If this is true, that there's quote unquote second sight in that line. I don't even know what they mean by second sight, but it sounds related. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, it, it feels to me like there's this whole other set of ways of perceiving of knowing of healing of holding space for the healing of people mm-hmm. animals other animals uh, plants the planet that we have known in times where we lived in a more quote-unquote indigenous way and then we somehow got this illusion that we're not indigenous to the planet or to the cosmos and so we feel this separation and we've gotten so indoctrinated to focus you know on the the cognition and the our rational linear thinking and then we literally have forgotten that that's one tiny percentage it's a very wonderful percentage (laughs) a wonderful part of us and there's so much more that we need we need to remember because there's so many gifts there that our world needs so (laughs) yeah yeah Well, and it's, you know, it's really interesting because 
you know, the, I do believe we need different ways of knowing. And, and I think that there is a story that we've been telling ourselves, especially in the Western world, that the body isn't that important, Exactly. Uh, you know, and we need to reclaim that body. Yeah. And, you know, as you were talking and I was thinking about this, I'm like, and it makes sense that if we are kind of separate from our bodies, you know, the damage that that causes, we can see in the damage to the earth itself. Literally. The body of the earth. Same. Yeah. Same, 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 same. All same. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Well, and it's also, I think that, and I want to be, I, I want to be a little bit careful here because I can't get away from my academic philosophical background don't try (laughs) well it's i I liked the book the the work in process i guess which i think will be a book consciousness in bloom and i like the way you phrased that and the reason that i liked that is that i notice in a lot of spiritual communities people will use various language. And one of the terms that I hear all the time really frustrates me. And it's when people start talking about 5D consciousness. Hmm. And when I started hearing about that, I'm like, what is that? Where is that coming from? Mm -hmm. And I think what that is, I think it's a meme. I think it's a meme how it meme was originally understood as like a little, you know, mind virus that just kind of spreads. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm very resistant to that. But at the same time, I try to step back and say, okay, well, what, what actually is being said here? And what's being said is that there's a need for a transformation of consciousness. Yeah. And I can be on board with that. And that's why I liked the title that you have, because I think it gives us a different way of thinking about it, of a blooming into a consciousness. And I can say, actually, I don't like the term 5D at all. Right, 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 right. right. (laughs) Because what I get told, what I get shown is that what we're really, what we're really aiming for, what is really being, we're being called into, I think, is Mm. infinite D. I mean, why five, why five? Right, right. Dimensions. That doesn't what I don't I don't personally understand what that means either. And yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure that I would agree with components of what people mean when they say that. And so I'm not putting it down completely, but I don't feel it doesn't encapsulate what I right. feel called to, into. Right. Uh, I feel like we are being I I'm being called into, and I think a lot of us are being called into remembering ourselves literally as existence, mm. which is infinite. It's it's it, it's infinity. So it's, it has infinite dimensions, not five, like right. five stops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> five, yeah. Five. I don't get yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And I also see that people who talk about sort of the 5D consciousness, sometimes there is this component of we are just going to end up being kind of like pure consciousness and escape our bodies. And no. like, that no. is not good. We, that's no, that's not helpful. That's not helpful at all. Uh, we we still need to be 3d we, we, we you know 40 we you know we still need to be embodied beings and embrace being embodied beings absolutely we are here for a reason we want to be here there's so much learning to happen through these bodies that are us and the, the earth the earth is a body right yeah, so yeah, right yeah. yes yeah and we are part of it it's yes we are the <laughs> we are we are yeah. here to be with the earth as the earth and I don't want to not do that. Otherwise we would just be, I don't know what spirits out there and we're here, we're here, we're right right here. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I really like about what you're doing, and this also is something that I'm deeply, deeply interested in, is that I see what's going on with the environmental crises that we are in as a spiritual issue. I see it as a religious issue. And when I say religious issue, I'm looking at the actual meaning of the word, you know, the etymology of religion, which mm-hmm. is to reconnect, to rebind. And that that's what we are being called to do. We have to reconnect and rebind with the earth and with each other. Well, so wait, okay. So re 
like lig as in yeah. Latin root of or like, like ligament like, ligari yeah yeah okay wow yeah. had never thought so li, lig, ligare is that like the yeah. latin word yeah and what does that literally translate as to re, to bind my right. understanding is the original was <laughs> connected with sandals like tying your sandals but yeah that's what the the etymology of religion is to rebind or to reconnect amazing I took Latin for three years, but I don't remember the, that word. That was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very long time ago. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. But, you know, I say that because I like the spiritual component to, to your work. And I think that that's really important and really valuable. And I was wondering, can you say a little bit more about the connection to spirit that you have that's driving your work forward? Sure. If you feel comfortable, if you don't yeah, feel no, comfortable, do. you don't I, have to. Yeah, yeah no, I, absolutely. It's what it's part of what I'm supposed to do is to be yeah. honest about it. And yeah, yeah I, I would say one of my learning edges right now is, for example, I'm trying not to use the word woo woo anymore. That's right. as of two days ago. That is one of my challenges to myself is to stop using that word hmm. because I do have this very strong academic intellectual side, right? And like, my kid's dad, who I was married to, has his PhD in religious studies, blah, 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 went to Harvard, blah, 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 all these things. Okay. I've, I have very strong, all of that in me. And, and then I have the social work side of me that is committed to social justice and all of that. Okay. All of that's true. Both of those are true. And then what happened is that um, five years ago when I was working and a really, really, really intense social work job supervising this program for our county, you know, very high pressure job that I was passionate about. I had an experience where eight, a circle of eight spirits came to me and told me that I was going to need to leave social work <clears throat> and I was going to need to start channeling. <laughs> and and I had had lots and lots and lots of other spiritual experiences. Like I said, you know, in my late twenties, I took off five years and I was a massage therapist. And I started having all of these weird knowings of how to help people heal and all that kind of thing. And I, and in that time frame in my twenties, I started being able to see spirit guides and pass. I could see people's past lives when I put my hands on them, all, you know, huge number of spiritual experiences that happened to me starting in my twenties. And so by the time I reached my early forties, five years ago, and this, you know, the circle of eight beings came to me, it, I certainly had already had lots and lots of spiritual experiences, but I was not, I was very closeted about it. So I was a supervisor at child welfare services, the social worker, and I definitely did not talk about my spiritual life there. And like I said, my kid's dad is, you know, academia type of guy, also very spiritual, but I had that intellectual kind of check checks and balance that's going on in me all the time so this was the most I would say out there experience mm -hmm. I had had up to that point and long 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 story very short essentially what these beings said to me all came true in uncanny ways that I could not deny like the scientific part of me just couldn't deny it and I did end up leaving social work a year later I did start channeling I started channeling the series of eight books called the living the one light series and i published the first three like in the next year and two after that and from that moment on five years ago essentially the the spirit world is what tells me how to live my life and i get shown i go in in my prayers every day i have this routine and i and i get taken into the space that's essentially I get shown the entire time space continuum, like a, like a womb kind of, mm. and I get taken through the whole thing out the outside the membrane of the time space continuum into what they call the spirit world calls the void. Mm. Um, and into the space of nothing and everything. Right. And then it's from there that I get, I channel and like, I get mm. told how to, what is mine to do in my own life. And I get shown whatever it is I'm meant to share with the world or mm. my clients or whatever it is. And what's really fascinating to me, and I'm still sitting with how I interpret all of this, 
not what narrative to give it, but what I have learned is that it seems like a lot of what I am experiencing in my spiritual world is weirdly similar to a lot of what goes on in like ancient Buddhist teachings, mm -hmm. which I have not been taught, right. but my kid's dad, you know, is very, very, very involved in the Gelupa mm. aspect of Buddhism. And so we've had con like, he, he's the intellectual side and then I'm over here experiencing things. And so he'll right. bounce off, you know, what he's learned intellectually and academically with mm. what it is I'm experiencing. And so through him and through other people who are more involved in actual Buddhist world, it does seem weirdly parallel. Mm. Mm, interesting. <laughs> and so I don't know what to make of that. It's just right. interesting. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, mm. and I do apologize if you felt like I put you on the spot. I no, 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 no. <laughs> but well, and it's, you know, it's interesting because, you know, doing this podcast, starting out, you know, being an academic, and I'm really trying to get out of being an academic. Initially, I had concerns about credibility mm -hmm. and people I would invite onto the podcast. All right. And there were some, I'm like, nope, nope, nope. That's too far. Uh, <laughs> a, a friend of mine, Stephanie Bidet, who is one of my co-hosts on the Cocktail Apocalypse, she and I talk a lot and we were talking about this because one of the things that I was very resistant to was people who claim to have experiences of fairies mm. and there was like one person yeah that would be me. <laughs> well yeah there was actually a book that someone mm. wrote also about and it was actually someone from cis mm. about spirit marriages and was talking about having this relationship with the spirit the spiritual being i'm like nope 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 i'm not going to do that i'm not having anyone who's had experiences with the fairy king nope 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 uh -huh. uh, but my but stephanie's like you know but you know if you consider the ideas that you have of consciousness because i think that consciousness is not something just generated by the brain i think that that story doesn't work and that consciousness is all around us and that it's vast and that there are quite possibly non-physical consciousnesses. Absolutely. And I have to see that as being part of the worldview that has come to form in my life. And it's always kind of modifying and changing. So I've opened up to <laughs> a lot of these things. I'm still cautious in some places, but I think that I also have to look at my own experiences. And I, you know, I think I told you before that last summer I was in Chaco Canyon in New Mexico and I heard voices. I had, you know, disembodied voices and it wasn't a conversation or anything, you know, first was a female voice and she was just like, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and then. A few hours later, I heard a male, a man's voice. And that one was just, hey, Nick. <laughs> and I was fully awake on both of them. And <laughs> I, you know, I'm like, I, I still don't exactly know what was going on, but I can't, you know, say that those were valid experiences for me, but that someone else who has an experience that it's invalid, you know, but at the same time, we want to... The, the, there's that academic part. I want to separate the wheat from the chaff and be really totally. careful. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, especially with the channeling, I think that one of the early works that was kind of influential for me was the work of Seth, Jane Roberts, the Seth material. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, if we look at it, you know, I think that a lot of the prophetic books, we would have to say they were channeled. The Quran was channeled, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or there's even a history to it. Right. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm getting guess you know more about this than I do, but even what the little I've heard about Einstein and his way of coming up with his theories, yeah. they weren't based in scientific experiments. They were right. mind experiments, right? So yeah. what is that? Right. I mean, he would write, that my, my understanding, again, I'm not an expert on Einstein yeah. at all, but my understanding is that he would spend a lot of time riding in circles on his bike. Hmm. And then these, these theories would just kind of come to him. Yeah. So I don't think that was coming through his rational brain. That doesn't sound like it right. to me. 
It sounds like it was coming from the collective consciousness, if you want to call it that, or something like it, it was, I think he was tapping into something way beyond the rational mm. mind, which I, I experienced, I experienced a similar ish thing. Not, I'm not right. Einstein, but I'm just saying like, right. you know, yeah. And I think about, there's this really, really beautiful documentary that I watched of the Dalai Lama talking with some of the most prominent quantum physicist mm. in the western world and i love that documentary yeah. but in what's so fascinating to me about it is that essentially it, so these are the 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 top minds like prize winning world renowned scientists right <clears throat> sitting sitting down with the dalai lama and saying explaining to the dalai lama their latest most cutting edge theories mm. of what existence is and it, and basically, bottom line, the Dalai Lama and some of the other monks with him are just sort of nodding, like, mm -hmm. "Yep." Yeah. <laughs> and guess what? They've known the exact same things and way more for how many thousands of years. Right. So, same thing. Like, I don't think that, let's say, Tibetan monks and I hope nuns too, yeah. sitting in a cave in Tibet would have been using sophisticated microscopes to come up with these these mm. theories of how molecules i mean subatomic particles work right like i don't think that's probably how they came to the same conclusions i think i don't know but i'm guessing it these monks and nuns were sitting there or being there together and were going into a different state of consciousness where they were probably mm being shown or told so they'd had other ways of knowing than through the five senses that i would right. i would put a lot of money on that if i had that money to put on it but you know <clears throat> i i don't know like maybe there's something i'm missing there yeah yeah no i think that you know a couple things with that is the one is i again i think that we don't know what mind is so mm. much mm. and you know one of the ways that this language used to be, I think was, you know, I remember back in, you know, the eighties and even into the nineties, the vocabulary that was used was not necessarily a change of consciousness, but it was a new paradigm. We need a new mm. paradigm. Mm -hmm. And, and this is part of like the new age movement. And I was always really kind of cautious of people announcing a new paradigm. You know, I'm like, I don't think you can announce it and have it be Mm. Um, and I think of paradigms through the work of the person who actually came up with the idea, Thomas Kuhn and his book, The Structures of Scientific Revolutions. Mm. And, you know, a paradigm, I think one way of looking at a paradigm is it is a story. Mm -hmm. yes. And in science, you know, it is, it, you know, we can also say it's a worldview yeah. or, you know, it's a set of axioms, right? But there is what creates a new paradigm is there's always an anomaly. There is something that the paradigm cannot answer. Yes. And it is the attempt to answer that question that gives rise to the new paradigm. Yes. And I think that what's going to give us the new paradigm is consciousness. Mm -hmm. Because in the Western world, at least, we actually haven't given it much thought ironically, you know, we have this dualism that we inherit from Rene Descartes, you know, mind body, and they're completely separate. But we can't even say how conscious we don't, we can't even answer, you know, much of what it is, let alone, you know, how we experience it. And it's like, that's so fundamental to the human experience, and we can't even explain it. But when you look to Eastern traditions, you know, the Indian traditions and Buddhism, mm -hmm mind has been central, you know, on the Dhammapada, the teachings of the Buddha, that's actually one of the first teachings is, you know, where mind is, everything else goes. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have a lot to learn from these other traditions in terms of mind and what's there. Yeah. And even to feel safe or supported to even explore the questions. Yeah. I mean, what's coming to me, and I'm curious how you would feel about this, <clears throat> I'm going to put a caveat on this that I love and appreciate all the, all the people I'm about to speak about, and I'm not going to name them by name, but so I went to a very, 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 very liberal, wonderful small college. 
and for kids essentially who you know were like super super smart and too a little too hippie to want to go to like an ivy league school okay so that kind of sums it up so wonderful humans i mean truly truly wonderful and i was so happy the whole four years i was there and on every level okay so I'm still Facebook friends with a lot of my alum, the, all of the other alums and a lot of the professors. And a couple of years ago, I saw a post by one of my old English professors who, again, I love, I love, I love all these people. Okay. But this post, I felt really sad and I felt angry and I felt confused. And what it was, was essentially she was saying that she wanted to do a course she had a thought about doing a course on quote unquote bad books i can't mm. remember the exact wording she put it something but what she wanted was the post was trying to elicit from her facebook friends including a lot of people a lot of alums from the college she teaches at what are some her question was what are some books that come to mind that you read maybe as a teenager or a young adult and you look back on them now and cringe like, right. Like maybe you loved them at the time. And now you look back and realize that was a horrible book. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So just right there, the construct of having a bad book, mm. I have an issue right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But second of all, okay, here's what ended up being on that list. Virtually all of them were spiritually oriented books, mm. such as the Mists of Avalon, Richard Bach books. I mean, so I get it. Like I get it. These are simplified spiritually oriented books that teenagers and young adults might particularly be drawn to like I see why those books might be put on a list like that especially by people who are highly academic and largely atheist right and how is that helpful to our world right name books like that which have were incredibly influential both of those were really deeply influential to me when I was 16 17 18 19 20 right and I probably would go back and look at them and cringe in a certain way I'm guessing I haven't looked at them in 25 years but why is that helpful right to narrate that in that way how does that serve our world and what does that do to our sense of safety in exploring our spirituality, like our intuition, something, anything beyond what academia deems as quote unquote good literature. Right. Really? Yeah. It just feels harmful. Yeah. It doesn't feel good at all. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. I agree. And I never read The Mists of Avalon, but I did read some Richard Bach books. So mm -hmm. I, I can yeah. understand. And I, I see that a lot too in this sort of, you know, what what they're calling the cancel culture as well. Mm. And I think sometimes we have a very difficult time. I recently saw someone, you know, in terms of fiction, I remember when I was in my early 20s, I was deeply into the writings of J.D. Salinger. And it was never actually the Catcher in the Rye. That was never my favorite. My favorite was always Franny and Zooey and the stories of the Glass family. And there's a lot of stuff in there that's, you know, non-dualistic and Buddhist. And a friend of mine on Facebook was posting about how she had read that he had had like an affair with a young woman. And th there were some issues in terms of, I don't think it was sexual assault. I don't think that was ever a case. And I know that, I know the story in more detail, but she kind of like, this is so horrible. Now I want to get rid of all of the books. And I'm like, but no, there's still value in them. You know, I'm not going to stop watching Buffy because Joss Whedon turned out to be an asshole. <laughs> you know? So yes, I understand. Lots and lots of people turn out to be. <laughs> I know, yes. I know. Including um, probably Gandhi and <laughs> including all. Oh yeah. No, no. I've heard those stories. I heard stories yeah. about Gandhi and. Martin Luther King Jr. And, you know, yeah. that's always, that's always an issue in terms of our moral exemplars. Yeah. You know, we forget, I think that they're human too, and that they're yeah. going to make mistakes and that eventually, you know, we have to be able to recognize that, recognize their humanity mm -hmm. and recognize the good teachings versus the bad actions. Yes. And, and not put people on pedestals and all yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So I, I know we've been talking for a while now. Let's go to community and talk about 
you're building of community because you've been <laughs> hard at work with this for a couple of years now with this re-becoming the one symposium. Mm. So I was wondering if you could maybe discuss what that is and what you're doing and kind of the goals of it and so on and so forth. Sure. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So re-becoming the one which you have been, you were part of last year and you're going to be a part of again this year is a symposium that I was told by that, by the spirit world mm -hmm. <laughs> very clearly to hold last year. So it actually came through on my birthday in 2022 mm -hmm. on March 5th, 20, 2022. I was working with some, some of my actually long time massage clients and they live in this beautiful spot overlooking the Pacific ocean, like up on a cliff and anyway, gorgeous. So I had my hands on the woman and, and she didn't know this, but what happened for me was that I had basically like the sense of a lightning bolt just came through my body. And I saw this vision of this whole symposium flash in front of my eyes. And I was told, do it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and I had never run a symposium. I you know, so many things about that just were completely new to me, a little daunting, but I did it. And I reached out to a few people to be speakers and they said yes. And then, you know, more and more people said yes. And it turned into this way bigger thing than I expected. It just had a life of its own, essentially. So last year there were, were 42 speakers and 1400 participants in the first Rebecoming the One. And the purpose of Rebecoming the One is essentially to hold collective healing space around healing of our relationships to gender, sexuality, love, and life itself. And, and it, that the symposium on one level is, is absolute, that's, that's its intention, what I just named. And on another level, it is also related to the next set of three books in that series of the living the one light series so again the living the one light series that i'm channeling as a set of eight books the first three were published you know years ago called living the one light gaia speaks and the cosmos speaks and those three are really simple and are reminders of ourselves as beings of the light the divine earth and the cosmos and those were really easy for me to channel just they just came through you know within a couple of days each essentially and they were done and out there within a year okay but the next set of three are called love speaks the goddesses speak and the gods speak and those three i've been sitting with for since 2019 <clears throat> so i channeled the first draft of love speaks in early 2020 and the first two-thirds of the goddesses speak in summer of 2020 and I haven't started the God speak. And so what those three, they're also kind of like a trio, like the first three are basically a trio. These three are a trio and they're, they, this set of three is essentially about the, the divine, the infinite manifestations of the divine feminine, the infinite manifestations of the divine masculine, and then the, the inner and outer healing between that divine feminine, that divine masculine, and the parallel between that inner process and the outer process. And even the the parallel between our inner healing of the feminine and masculine to our relationship to anything, including the plant, this planet Earth, life, the everything. So I think like when I reflect on it, when I step back from it, I think that this set of three is taking a long time because I'm not personally ready to channel them fully. And I think our collective isn't quite ready for me to channel them either in a sense. And so this, these, the symposium, I think is on one level, a way for that, that collective healing and conversation to happen. And also a way for me to become more integrated and able to be the channel for the books. Like it's, so it's, you know, it's a parallel process there too. But on that more collective level, last year, as you know, the symposium was eight days and each day had a theme. <clears throat> the The feedback I got from participants was that they wanted less talks and longer time to integrate them. So this year there are, it's, it's 
The symposium will be held over the entire month of June and will be available indefinitely also actually for free, but each week has a theme as opposed to last year, which where every day had a theme. So the, in, the way I'm setting things up, especially this year is I'm trying very consciously and deliberately to create a space and a structure that truly facilitates healing on that collective level. And the best way we can, I mean, online, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. there's lots of limitations there, but I'm trying to give space fully, a full week to the divine feminine, a full week to the divine masculine, a full week to the divine person, meaning like including conversations around the non-binary and gender fluidity and all of that. And then an entire week to the question or to the topic of <clears throat> bringing us all to wholeness, re-becoming the one. Mm -hmm. And so I would say the two components of the symposium that feel really important to name are, number one, I think in our world, we've had a lot of spaces where people who identify as women tend to talk about the experience of the divine feminine and you know healing that and it, the reemergence of it, which is great. And I love, and I'm definitely a part of that. I hold my own goddess, monthly goddess series. I mean, you know, I'm definitely into that. Then I feel like we have another set of spaces where there's people who identify as men, focus on the healing of the masculine, and maybe have men's groups within the men's movement and all of that. And then we, but then we haven't had two things, I think. Number one, I don't see much in the way of addressing any of this that incorporates and includes the non-binary, gender fluidity, and a non-heteronormative narrative. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's like, like the narrative I hear most often is find your inner feminine, find your inner masculine, help them heal, and then your perfect heterosexual mate will <laughs> manifest and your, your life will be perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so this symposium is trying to help hold it, hold this in a way that is celebratory of all gender identities and all sexual orientations and also does it in a way that brings together those sort of more disparate groups right like the people over here typically doing the feminine and people over here doing the masculine let's bring us all back together and let's include people and ourselves even if we are identify as non-binary or whatever and however we identify in terms of sexual orientation let's all do the healing together yeah <laughs> yeah, wonderful. And this year, there's also going to be some workshops, right? Yes. And you're doing one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So last year, the entire 42 talks and panels were all free. This year, also, the vast majority of it is free. There are 30 free talks, four free live panel discussions, all of this recorded, all of this available indefinitely. There's also this year a free online community forum like sort of like mighty network but it's on the the network called circle mm -hmm. and so that's a place people can go and connect with each other and create a profile and you know just really get to know each other and have conversations and in addition in order to make this both sustainable for me <laughs> as a single mom who needs to feed my children and also for the the speakers who are doing a, putting a lot into this and also to help participants have a way to go more deeply into some of the topics, there are also 13 optional paid workshops and optional paid sharing community sharing circles. So for the community sharing circles, I'm just asking for like a really small donation, like $10, <laughs> mm, yeah. you know, for the whole month. For the for the workshops, I'm asking a little bit more, but still the prices are pretty reasonable. And then there's also an option to do the the all-in-one bundle, which I've mm. given a sliding scale set of options. So I'm trying to make it really accessible. And for people who can afford it and do feel called to, they can support the whole project more, you know, in a bigger way financially. Right. right. Yeah. And when does the symposium start? June 1st. So it goes 1st. from June 1st to June 30th, the whole, it's actually pride month. <laughs> too. Okay. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
And where can people go to find out information or to sign up for the workshops, to view the presentations? Yeah, the whole, all of it is linked on my website, which is livingtheonelight.com. And so the very top thing on, when you go to the, my main website is a link to the symposium, the free part of the symposium. And then I think you'll probably have a link like to your specific workshop. Mm. And there's on, when you go to that main link for the free symposium, the free symposium also then takes you, you have an option to click on another button that will take you to the optional paid workshops. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, just witnessing the amount of work that you put into creating this, I can't even, I don't know the words to use to say how impressed I am by all that you've done with that. And, and I'm very honored to be part of it. I, I'll be honest, the, you know, because this year I'm presenting on the divine masculine and that was a struggle for me. And I'm even now like, oh, with what I was doing, because I ran it by a couple of friends of mine and they're like, how is this masculine? I'm like, well, good question. I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, I would say the divine masculine, the divine masculine week last year and this year, yeah. both are the, the most, I don't know what the right word is, edgy yeah. or yeah. challenging for people, yeah. or definitely the hardest to get people willing yeah. to speak. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, you know, we hear about the divine feminine a lot, but it's the divine masculine. You know, there's this idea of the, you know, you've got the patriarchal ideas and, you know, God, the father, the masculine God, it's, it's tricky. It's, it's an area that I don't think is fully explored. And I think that that's the issue I had with it. It's like, well, how do you, because it made me start thinking, you know, as a man, but, you know, also as a gay man, it's like, well, how do I, what is the masculine, you know, because I identify as masculine, I identify as male, but it's like, where's the divine, because I guess for me, I just see my spirituality as more neutral, I suppose, that I recognize the feminine and the masculine aspect. But when I relate to spirit, I don't see spirit as either, mm. you know, maybe I see it as both. I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say. It's very difficult to say, but I ground all mine in the, in nature yeah. and definitely in nature, there is masculine and feminine. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, yeah, it's fun. It's, it's a good exploration and I encourage everyone to go and sign up and participate and support the work you're doing because it's incredible. Mm, thank you. Yeah. And I just want to say that <clears throat> another big component of how I'm trying to hold this space is that I have a deep conviction and commitment to the reality that all of us have wisdom that is needed yeah. in this. Yeah. It's not, this is the issues we're trying to address in our world are not going to be saved by a few elite people who quote unquote have yeah. answers. That is yeah. incorrect not right, gonna right. work that way so you know i'm trying to in the symposium hold, have lots and lots of ways for various mm. for people for your own voice to come through yeah. you're a participant and i also have structured it in a way so this year every week i have a different co-facilitator right. again to bring in that idea that that this we're all in this together it's not right. Right. yeah <laughs> yeah. And I think that's so important to do, you know, kind of bottom up versus top down. Yes. You know, that's the structures we need. Yeah. yeah. There we go. That's another shift of narrative too. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 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 Well, Martha, I, I know I've kept you here for quite a long time. I appreciate your time. I appreciate the conversation. I know that we could talk for a very, very long time about a lot of things, yeah. but I'm going to end it here. I think, I think we got a good place to end. Is there any final words that you have that you would like to share with the audience before we? I think just I'll reiterate what I just said, which is yes, please sign up for the symposium because we want your voice. We want your wisdom. We want your yeah. heart. We want, we want everybody. We all matter. We all count yeah. and you're yeah. very welcome. <laughs> yeah. And we all need to remember who we are. Yes, that too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and I'll put, I'll make sure I have links for the symposium and 
you know, I'll put links in for my, my workshop and everything. I think that's on June 16th at 9 a.m. Yep. Very At least good. that's what I've been telling people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it, and they're all recorded. So you don't have yeah. to be there live. And yeah. yes. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm excited for it. I, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, as a participant last year, you know, I know that I went through and watched a lot of the videos mm. that you had, and I found so much wisdom and insight mm. and areas that made me really think. And mm. I just found it nourishing. I found it all mm. very nourishing. I'm glad. Yeah, I did yeah. too, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. It's, I imagine yeah. it's very rewarding. Do you ever have, I, here's a loaded question. Do you ever have any thoughts of maybe having it outside of cyberspace to have it in a physical space? Mm, that I hadn't considered that. I mean, I absolutely, definitely really miss doing work in person with humans. Mm-hmm. And so in general, yes, I, I absolutely want to be holding, you know, in-person retreats or all kinds of things. But in terms of re-becoming the one, I hadn't thought of that, but that yeah. is an amazing idea. Yeah. 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 Well, and you could do both. I mean, people do yeah. in-person and then record it and mm. um, yeah, it would be tricky. I think, you know, to have, get everyone there because I know the, the speakers are all from all over the place, all over the world. Yeah. 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 And participants last year were from 54 different countries. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so yes, yes. And I mean, yeah, you, you planted a seed though. Okay, good. I, I like to really plant like seeds. That. That's what I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, Martha, again, thank you so much. I really appreciated your time today. Thank you. All right. And that's a wrap on episode 83 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you are part of my YouTube audience or view this on Spotify. If you like what I do here on Rebel Spirit Radio and would like to support my work, and please support my work, uh, please consider becoming a patron. You can find the link for the Patreon in the show notes or the video description. And of course, if you'd prefer to make a one-time donation, you can still do so via PayPal. I will be tremendously, incredibly grateful for any support that you can provide. Another way that you can help the podcast is to share it with friends, family, or even coworkers that you think will enjoy it. And please share it on social media too. That really is one of the best ways that you can help and support the podcast. So if you feel moved by the rebel spirit, and I sure hope that you do, then please, by all means, help spread the good news. Also, if you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive rating on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. And please subscribe. For those viewing on YouTube, please make sure that you hit that um, thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel. Also, make sure you hit that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to, or watching, Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit.